Thank you for having me here. It's an honor to be in front of this great group. I'm, I'm so excited that patients are excited about their learning more about their disease. That's always the first step to doing better. So we're going to talk a little bit about We've had, heard great talks about what to do with keratoconus and manage it up to a certain point. And once patients get to a point where their keratoconus is very severe and they're not really great candidates for things like contact lenses, they can't seem to wear their contact lenses any more comfortably, then they either come to me or one of my cornea co colleagues like uh, Dr. Garg or Dr. Wade to then discuss surgical options. So we're, we're gonna talk a little bit now about what are some of the surgical options available for keratoconus. And cornea transplant is always like, oh my gosh, it's like the worst possible thing. But I just wanna put it out there that it's not anymore. In this day and age, it's not so daunting and the technology has advanced uh, so much and I banking has advanced so much and uh, quality of donor tissues have advanced so much that it's not the worst thing. So I, I tell patients, don't worry, if you need it, you need it and we'll take care of it. So when do we consider surgical uh, intervention? Once the corneal irregularity is so high that contact lens wear is no longer a reasonable option or you don't get good vision with the contact lenses, or the cornea is so uh, misshapen that the contact lens keeps falling off or very uncomfortable. Um, many uh, keratoconus patients get central scarring um, because of that uh, shape or uh, history of high drops in the cornea, but central scarring limiting vision is another indication for surgery. And then significant thinning concerning for traumatic perforation. So sometimes the cornea gets so severely thin in some areas that um, when I see them in, in the office, I'm worried about that hard lens going in and rubbing against that thin zone because it can, the cornea can perforate when it gets very, very thin. So in those instances, we then discuss what are some options. So intacts, I put this in here. It's more of a procedure than a surgery, but I do want to talk about that a little bit today. Um, it, it's, its indication is to reshape and flatten the cornea a little bit so that patients can get back into contact lens or glasses wear. And then corneal transplantation, and I'll, I'll discuss that in, in um, uh, more detail. So intacts, uh, there are these little segments that go into the corneal stroma. And the goal is that when you put these into this misshapen cornea that the, the two segments together work to flatten the cornea um, and reshape it, try to give it a little bit more of a normal shape. Um, they are uh, placed into these little tunnels and the tunnels we make here using a femtosecond laser. So we use a little laser to create tunnels. And then in the same laser room, the same uh, LASIK suite that we do our LASIK patients, uh, we then slide two segments in. And sometimes they're the same thickness and sometimes they're asymmetrical thickness depending on um, the degree of astigmatism. Sometimes we put a heavier segment on the area where the cone is more uh, steep and a lighter segment on the other side of the cornea. But essentially the two of them then work together to flatten it and I don't know if you can tell in this picture it's, it's not very easily seen but there's two little segments in this cornea and they're very small. Um, good for mild cases, you have to have a certain amount of thickness on your cornea to, to slide these into. So there has to be about 400 microns or 0.4 millimeters of thickness in the thinnest area or in the area that where these slide through. Otherwise, they can actually extrude. If there isn't enough substance there, the, the segments can come out of the cornea and that would be a problem. So we do a map and make sure there's enough tissue to slide these in. And then again, the goal is to sort of reshape the cornea and get patients either back into a contact lens or a soft lens or glasses comfortably. Um, in the past, our experience has been many patients end up still needing to go on and have corneal transplantation. So they might do okay with intacts for a while, and then eventually uh, they continue to progress. Now, the discussion was, what if we combine this with um, like cross-linking and try to, and, and many doctors are doing this out in community. 
The bottom line is nobody knows. Nobody knows because there's no big trials to show that this works. Um, I think it's a potentially a very good idea. Some doctors cross-link first, stiffen the cornea, and then put the Intax in. Some people do them at the same time. Some people put the Intax in and then cross-link. Nobody knows. Nobody knows, and a lot of people kind of make their own recipe and do their own thing. And time will tell what actually works and what is a good standard protocol. Um, but um, there are, somebody here mentioned that there are these kind of combination um, techniques and the bottom line is one of, hopefully more and more information will come out of the cases that have been done and we'll know what actually um, is feasible and safe for patients. Okay, so we'll move on to corneal transplantation. I, I want to give a rough overview on how much corneal transplantation has actually um, uh, advanced over the past few years. In the past, anybody with any disease on the cornea, whether it was on the inner layer of the cornea, whether it was keratoconus, whether it was a corneal infection, whether it was ocular surface disease, whatever it was, they had one type of transplant, which was we basically take a little cookie cutter, cut out maybe an eight or nine millimeter button of the cornea on the center, throw it out, take one from the donor and, and use the same cookie cutter, cut that uh, button out and then put it in and sew it into place. Well, that's good and many people may have in this room may have had that type of transplant and, and there's nothing wrong with it, but we've come a long way since those days. So we have now, for example, femtosecond laser technology. We have a laser that can help cut the cornea in different shapes to make the cut patterns and the fits fit better, and I'll talk more about that. We also have disease-targeted surgery. So not every corneal disease gets the same corneal transplant. So for patients who have endothelial disease, diseases of the inner layer of the cornea, we can actually just go in through a very small incision and transplant only the inner layers of the cornea. For patients who have stromal disease or stromal irregularities such as keratoconus, we can try to save the inner layer because the endothelial cells of the cornea are healthy in most keratoconus patients. If they have not had a history of high drops or it, they're not too out of shape, we can try to save those and transplant everything except that inner layer and there are benefits to that and I'll talk about that. And then for patients who have severe ocular surface disease, um, there are things like artificial corneal transplants and limbal stem cell transplants, which I won't go into detail today, but just to kind of point out that you know, we have now a lot more variety in, in the field of corneal transplantation. So let's talk about femtosecond laser technology. So the femtosecond laser was FDA approved for corneal surgery, I think around 2005 or 2006. It's an ultra fast laser. It uses something called photo disruption to create very precise, accurate cuts within the cornea. So here's like a cornea and we can make an infinite number of various patterns and shapes and cuts in the cornea using the femtosecond laser. So uh, our favorite here is the zigzag shape. So essentially we make three cuts under the laser in the patient's cornea and the same exact cut in the donor cornea. So it's a lock and key fit. So instead of getting that cookie cutter uh, cut, you get a nice zigzag formation here and a nice zigzag formation here so when it comes together it locks into place so it has an interlocking pattern versus the old technique now if anybody knows anything about carpentry you know a butt joint is kind of the weakest joint uh, weakest way of so there's a lot of potential for irregularity torsion this has much much less uh, uh, of those kinds of irregularities because of this nice pattern the angled edges also provide a smooth transition between the host cornea and the donor cornea. It's an interlocking pattern, more precise opposition, faster healing. This is a patient who had had a corneal transplant. This is called an OCT image. It's almost like an x-ray of the cornea, although we don't use x-rays. It's very safe to get this image. But um, you can see when the cornea heals, you can actually see the zigzag pattern in the heel. So uh, there's much more surface area for healing. Uh, the wound integrity is better with these cornea. 
Um, there's greater mechanical stability. There's better incision alignment, so there's less misalignments. We talked about that. And uh, we don't need to apply as much suture tension because of that rapid healing. Sutures can come out sooner. Now we've, there's a whole body of literature now to support all of these things I mentioned. Patients can have their sutures removed faster. They have faster visual recovery, earlier suture removal. And um, the femtosecond laser can also create little marks so we know exactly where to put our sutures. Basically, just it makes everything much, much more precise and exact. This is what the patient looks like under the femtosecond laser. The femtosecond laser um, also is used in LASIK, actually, to create the little flap that we do in LASIK. So um, we use it for multiple different things now in ophthalmology. But this is, it has a little cone that comes down and sits on the cornea. And then you can mon watch on a monitor and you can see the cut that it's making on um, the cornea. Post-operative appearance looks something like this. Um, we can actually, on high um, uh, magnification, we can actually appreciate those three little cuts of the zigzag that are made. And then we can use standard suturing technique to close this, either with a running pattern or multiple little interrupted patterns. Um, and we get very, very nice shapes. So we did one of our earlier studies. We were very privileged here at UC Irvine because the inventors of the femtosecond laser technology for cornea uh, are from our department. They are in the biomechanics um, engineering department and uh, one of our faculty here, Dr. Ron Kurtz and Tibor Uhouse. Um, and so we were one of the first sites to have a femtosecond laser for this purpose. So we started doing these early on, right at the onset. And so we've collected a lo lot of data, probably done close to four or five hundred cases now using femtosecond laser technology. But our initial study here, which was published in 2009, uh, we compared some eyes with the zigzag cut, 39 eyes, and to conventional, what we call conventional corneal transplant is the way we used to do things. And uh, we found that by month three, much less astigmatism in the zigzag group versus the conventional keratoplasty group. And then vision, now vision here, the lower, because this is a logmar scale, so the lower here, the better. So at month, month one, the red is the zigzag group, the blue is the conventional group. Much bigger percentage of patients were recovering vision faster. So we had a significant difference in the early period, which showed us that the patients in the femtosecond laser group were actually, the vision was recovering faster. And now we've done, this is a little bit of an older slide, we've done closer to 400 or, or maybe even more than that at this point. Multiple different surgeons and uh, measuring vision and uh, astigmatism. Overall, much better out to five years and more where the visual acuity achieves something on the range of 20, 25 with correction, with a spectacle correction and maintains over the long term. And this is astigmatism, three diopters and, un, uh, and below as early as month three post-operative, and this maintains throughout the follow-up period. This is really good compared to conventional keratoplasty. Um, another study came out, and, and you don't have to worry about the details of this, I'll summarize it. Essentially, um, patients with the femtosecond laser corneal transplant, even though they may have some astigmatism, the astigmatism is more regular. So uh, less patients uh, are forced to go into hard contact lens wear after corneal transplant. Some can get into soft toric contact lenses, and a lot more patients can get into glasses now. So a lot of patients just want to get rid of those contact lenses. So there's a larger percentage of these patients that can get into glasses following transplant surgery. Um, so what is DALK? I mentioned this earlier. It's a deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. Uh, where we replace the entire cornea except for that inner layer of endothelial cells. This is great for keratoconus patients or any other corneal diseases that involve the uh, stroma the, and the front of the cornea. So what we did, so the, the definition is to replace the entire cornea except decimase membrane, which is that inner lining of the cornea. 
and the benefits, why do this instead of doing a full thickness transplant? Because the ris risk of rejection um, becomes much, much less. So most of the time in a cornea transplant patient, if they have a rejection episode, they are rejecting those inner layer of cells. Well, we can, if we can have the patient keep their own inner layer of cells, then their risk of rejection becomes much less. Not quite zero, because they can reject the rest of the cornea, but much, much less. Also, the, uh, the risk of um, surgery is less because there's less of an open eye surgery with deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. So we combine this procedure with our uh, femtosecond laser zigzag incision so we can get the benefits of both types of surgery. So we can get the benefits of the rapid wound healing, less astigmatism, and all of that from the femto zigzag but also maintain the patient's own uh, endothelium. So how do we do this? The first step is we make the zigzag cut, but we leave a little bridge, about 70 microns of uncut tissue. And then we roll the patient. So we do this in the laser room. And then from here, we roll the patient into the, the main operating room. We then use a, um, an air-filled syringe on a thin needle, and we slide it into this back layer of the cornea, and we use a puff of air to separate the inner layer, which is here depicted in red, from the rest of the cornea. Now, how often does this happen? We're successful at this separation, I would say about 70% of the time. And uh, the reason is sometimes some patients have had either high drops and they're, uh, they have an old hole that we haven't seen in here and it just doesn't work, or some patients, uh, the decimase is so stuck on that that separation doesn't occur. But about 70% of the time, we're actually able to achieve what we call bearing of decimase membrane or that nice separation. We then use regular corneal scissors to remove the rest of the cornea leaving inside that decimase membrane or that inner layer of tissue. And then we use a regular donor cornea, which has been pre-cut with the same zigzag cut. We remove its endothelium or its inner layer and then suture it on like a standard corneal suturing technique. Um, Post-op care after corneal transplantation, whether you've had a zigzag, whether you've had a conventional, whether you've had DALK, Basically, it's, the post-operative care is all essentially the same. Um, so visual recovery. Um, in the first one to two weeks after cornea transplant, there's a lot of haze, there's a lot of light sensitivity. Patients, you know, I tell them this is not like LASIK or cataract surgery where the next day you're, you're a happy camper. Although many, many keratoconus patients who are very, very steep actually notice a big difference even as early as day one. They notice that they're overall um, vision is much improved. But I tell them, wait, it's, it, it gets better than this. But the first two weeks, there's a lot of light sensitivity. And then the final visual recovery, depending on the type of surgery there was, depending on how rapidly the scar of that um, transplant heals, takes somewhere between four months to a year. And we do suture adjustments and selective suture removal starting maybe at post-operative post month three or four, and then it may continue for several months. Um, at some point, when everything looks stable and we're doing serial topographies, as Dr. Gard mentioned, to get that cornea as um, spherical as possible and minimize the astigmatism as much as possible, when we feel we've achieved a really good place, whether there's still sutures in or not, then we send you over to Dr. Che or Dr. Blaze to then talk about contact lens or glasses or the next step at that point. Uh, although you, uh, cornea transplant patients need follow-up um, to monitor for things like rejection, um, sutures getting loose, things like that every few months with the cornea specialist. Rejection risk is very minimal, less than 3% and less with the DALK procedure, although never zero. So patients are always put on um, an anti-rejection drop, like steroid drops, at least for the first year, if not longer, depending on the age. Older patients tend to reject less, younger patients tend to reject more. So in my younger patients, I keep them on steroids longer and at higher frequency. In my older patients, we tend to take them off sooner. And the goal of transplant is, again, to get patients back into a contact lens comfortably or into glassware.
All right, so conclusions on corneal transplantation. Corneal transplants in this day are not so daunting and visual results are excellent. The femtosecond, has given, uh, the femtosecond laser has given surgeons new tools for achieving better and faster visual recovery. And we now have uh, technology to specifically address only the part of the cornea which is diseased. So thank you very much. I think if you have questions, I'll open it up at this point.